Welcome, everybody. This is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast, joined by special guest host, Christopher Serrato, filling in for Ileana Clone Rosa, who is still sick with a very sickly baby. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about Christopher Watts and the untimely murders of his family as he was exploring the prospects of a relationship with his mistress, Nicole Kessinger. Is she responsible or involved in any way in the murders that were committed back in 2018? We're going to discuss coming up next. Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. We're going to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney, and it's after hours. So have a seat, feel free to have a drink, and join me. Let's get started. And we're back. All right. So Christopher Watts, this is a case that I have been avoiding doing for a long time, I've been following him, I mean, since these murders took place back in 2018. I remember this case specifically because, number one, it was around the time where I had just opened up my own law firm, and I was starting, and it was in July of 2018, and this was all on the news. And I remember seeing um, him go on camera as he was being reported in the media. His wife was missing, his children were missing, and he goes on, and he offers this very I want to say in passion, but if you re if you actually watch the clips uh, of him talking about, I want my family back, it was just this very monotone voice and void of emotion. He's almost like joking around with the camera people. I want to find them. I want them to come home safe, like wherever they are. I hope they are safe. And I really, I really hope they can just come home. Just being in that house and not being able to tuck them in. Pleading for his wife to come back home with the babies. He had initially tried to say that, oh, I don't know, Shanann, she must have just decided, you know, we were talking about getting a divorce. She must have took the kids and left. And he kept on trying to pass off that story. And the whole way that it, it, it came about was startling for the country and really the world to watch. For myself, at that time in 2018, I was not yet married with a couple of children. I was, I don't remember if I was married or not, but definitely my two children were not on the way. But now, as I do this show, I have been married to my wife now for about five years now. Uh, we have a four and a three-year-old, about to be five and four. And so my family picture, my family dynamic almost mirrors what Christopher Watts had in his life. And here's a guy, he was maybe 31, 32 years old at the time. He had a beautiful wife. He had beautiful children. He lived in this beautiful house in the picturesque town of Colorado where he was living. They weren't necessarily rich per se, but they were making ends meet and they were all, all for all intents and purposes, living a very happy life. Then he meets Nicole Kessinger, who was a co-worker of his, and they developed some kind of a, a, a romance that had blossomed into whatever it was going to become. And in the prospects of exploring that relationship to wherever it was going to go, he decided in cold blood to dispatch of his pregnant wife, Shanann, and his two babies. And here we are. Now there's been speculation that has come about because he has, and I don't want to say this, this was the thing that spurred on this theory. There's been a lot of people that have suggested that Nicole Kessinger was more involved in the murders than she let on, than what she told investigators. But his jailhouse cellmate basically said that he heard a version of the story from Christopher Watts himself that suggested that Nicole was the one that snuffed the life out of his two young daughters. How you doing, Chris? Pleasure to... Ooh. I know. Wow. Before I get too much into it, <laughs> how are you doing? Wow. I'm, I'm doing pretty great myself, but I, didn't, I actually did not know that Nicole was um, 
involved. Now, she heard that version that she's yeah killed his children. Like, well, yeah. that's the speculation. And how it could? I, I mean, I've I've watched hours and hours of the interrogation videos, and I mean, there's literally YouTube channels that are devoted exclusively to this story. This co this this case has been covered ad nauseum. There wasn't even a trial with this case. He was interrogated by police. Within a very short time, they kind of just figured that this guy was in on it. He first tries to go and ex convince the interrogators that, oh, we were just having, I would never cheat on my wife. And we were just having an emotional time and we were going through maybe a separation. And, but, you know, I would never think that she would take the children, but maybe she did. Maybe she would just left to her friend's house. The evidence that was available, I mean, you can see it's all out. It's, it's all there on YouTube or wherever you want to uh, look for it. All the evidence that they have. So there's this very famous video taken from the dash cam, essentially from the officer that was questioning him. And they're doing the, in, the interrogation and Christopher Watts is kind of just giving his BS story. And before they get there, one of the friends of Shanann is, is talking with the cops and talking about there's no way that Shanann would just leave without telling anybody. I mean, she has medication. She's got doctor's appointments. She had things she was looking forward to. She's not just going to up and leave. They had been having relationship issues for months prior to that, and which is a story in of itself. And, and so the marital issues basically started when, I mean... I don't know when they exactly they started, but what they were going through at the time was Shanann was deeply suspecting that Chris was involved with another woman. And there's text messages, text messages with her going back and forth with one of her friends, explaining the perils of their relationship and how to get Chris back. And she was carrying on about, I don't know what's wrong. Like I'm, I'm doing all of these things and he's not being responsive to me. He's um, mm -hmm. become absent. He's very uh, distant. They go on this trip to South Carolina and very shortly prior to the murders. And they have this trip on the beach and then you know, they're there to visit family. And then, you know, Chris is off kind of in his own world and doing his own thing. But this lady is going through it. I mean, she's going through what really for my interpretation as a family law attorney, was the beginning stages of a divorce. This was a divorce that was in utero. This is where they were headed, the way that it was going. Shanann is looking for any conceivable way to save her marriage. There was other issues. There was Chris's parents, for whatever reason, had a strong dislike for Shanann as a person. They felt that she was too controlling. She felt like or, or they felt like she was, you know, just not the one for Chris. She felt, they felt that she was too protective of their children. There was a whole episode that occurred when mm. one of their daughters had like a peanut allergy and then she's serving up peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, she being Chris's mom. And then just basically telling her, oh, you know what? You just need to get over it. You're being a little bit overprotective and all of this kind of stuff. There was this huge argument that leads up to Shanann basically standing her ground like, look, I'm not just going to sweep this under the rug. Our children could have died. And so there's this whole family dynamic. There's this whole underswell of tension brewing with the family, obviously culminating in Shanann's death. But prior to all of that, all this is pressure, just building and building and building and building. There's multiple various speculations about what happened the night that Shanann was ultimately murdered. But they, you have her on surveillance camera. She's coming up to the house. She's very pregnant at the time with what would have been uh, their third child together. And on that night, that was the night that ultimately Christopher decided that he was going to murder his wife. He confessed to the whole thing. And the way that that whole thing came about was so compelling to watch. And the babies are gone. And I put my hands around my wife's neck and did that same thing. Did she fight back at all? But if you were ever to make the case of demonic possession, as many people have speculated out there, 
that why would a man that has so much in life, this beautiful wife, these beautiful children, this beautiful house and everything going for him in life, just decide on a whim to snuff it all out in the name of a mistress? In what world does that ever make sense? As opposed to saying, you know what, we're just going to get separated and we're going to get divorced. I'm going to send you a check, child support and all that and we'll figure it all out, custody and visitation. No, he, he, he doesn't even have the good sense to do that. He just decides that rather than leave, I'm just going to snuff out my whole family. In the way that he told the FBI that he carried out the murders was just gut-wrenching to listen to a grown man charged with protecting those two babies and that woman who was the mother of his child to take them out the way that he did and dispose of their bodies the way that he did, as opposed to just saying, you know what, I'm having a midlife crisis at 32. I don't think that Shanann is the woman for me. I'm going to go see what it's like with Nicole Kessinger because she really gets me, or whatever he was thinking. What are your opinions, Chris, about why something like that could possibly happen with a man? And again, 32 years old. And I, well, yeah. What do you think? Well, no, I, I'm, I'm, I think that he's, you know, he's terrible. I'm not in any way in that, you know, that this is okay. But what I would speculate is that this guy, the contrast of high emotions of in some crazy love affair, apparently that's, you know, sexual or, you know, whatever he was all and with also having young kids and then a wife with, marital issues who's pregnant and I know that can be really hard and if you're already having issues with a person there's all the hormones and then you have this other fairly con high contrast of both of those emotions you're out of your mind I mean, well let's take a look at who Christopher Watts was so at the time that these murders were committed and you're a workout guy you see guys coming to the gym mm -hmm. and when they're just getting started and they come in and they, they're, you know, a little pudgy around the edges, maybe, you know, they're a little bit out of shape and all of a sudden they start getting about six months in and they're getting all of these new gains and their, their body composition starts to change. It starts to lose a little bit of weight, put on a little bit of muscle and then confidence starts coming from places that they never had it before. And all of a sudden, they start getting noticed by the opposite sex, or maybe the same sex, doesn't matter. And this is a guy that's been married to Shanann for, I forget how many years it was, but, you know, long enough to be having two children pregnant with a third. And so he used to be, I don't know if he was overweight, but he was definitely pudgy, is the way that people have described it. And so now he's starting to get into shape. And one of the things that Shanann had done, one of her career ventures was she was like a multi-level marketer, but she was making money at it. And one of the things that she was selling was like these health products. And so they, she would make uh, health shakes and protein shakes or whatever. And that's, she started getting the family all in on that. Chris was all, all about it. He was uh, consuming these shakes. He was on his workout routine. He, would, he had this whole thing. And he started getting in shape in a way that he'd probably never experienced before. He, if you've ever heard him speak, is not particularly charismatic. I wouldn't go as so far as to say that he had a mental disability, but in terms of charisma, in terms of the ability to entice people with his personality, on the strength of his words, on the strength of, you know, whatever, he didn't really have it like that. And so, Shanann was not an unattractive woman by any means, you know, in the way that you hear her tell it, they met like on Facebook, sort of, kind of, and she didn't really want a relationship with him. Things kind of developed that way. And ultimately she did end up dating and they get married and, you know, kids and the whole thing. But so here he is, he's in this marriage by all accounts, things are going okay. It might not be the perfect marriage. I'm sure they had problems like everybody else. It wasn't perfect, but they were making it work. And if you look at where they were in society, I mean, they had this beautiful house. I don't know how they were able to afford that house on the income that they stated in discovery that they had. They made basically about 100000 a year between the two of them. He's making about 50000 as an oil tanker employee. And she was, through her multi-level marketing, making a similar income. 
So they were probably living above their means, but they were making it work. It was one of those things where you fake until you make it. And she had no designs on staying, only making that amount of money. I'm sure she had designs on at some point increasing income and all those things, but they were on their way. And his daughters were like these just, <sighs> it's so hard to see those little girls and not see the silhouettes of my daughters who are the same age as them right now when their lives were taken out. And just the cutest little kids you would ever see. Like you'd see them and, and just, they belong on like commercials, Gerber com commercials, whatever. Yeah. And he has this family and it's growing. And because, I don't know, his own insecurities, the, the one crazy check down at the office decides to uh, hit him up and, you know, see what's up. And starts making inquiries and they start going to lunch together. Maybe they start going to dinner together. I don't know. But they start becoming a romantically involved. And in his eyes, in his eyes, because he's been married to the, his wife for however long, Nicole Kessinger is like the new bright, shiny thing. And where he wasn't used to getting attention prior to this, because he's now this person that's in shape and he, he's starting to get attention that he's never had before, I suspect, all of a sudden he's all about it. He decides to pursue this relationship. Yeah. And so she goes on like this six week vacation, or it wasn't even vacation related, it was like on this, this work. There was, she was gone for like six months or six months, six weeks, which gives him basically the opportunity to live the life of a single man that he'd never had an opportunity to do before. And in that span of time, he cultivates this relationship with Nicole and they start going on dates and he very brazenly where prior to that, they would go on dates, but he would like keep it hidden, like paying cash or never put it on whatever, but he's paying for their dates on the joint statement debit card that him and Shanann had because he had no designs on keeping it secret any longer. All the while, you know, Shanann's over there with the kids trying to make things work and wondering why her marriage is in shambles and shattering at the fringes and imploding upon itself. And he's living it up. Life of a single guy. They're going like sand dunes and uh, doing all these crazy things, flirtatious text messages back and forth and sexting and all of that. And I'm sure it was all very exciting for him. But he lets that grow. And then she comes back. And then, you know, she says, oh, he's so distant. And she's almost pleading to her friend about why things are falling apart. And I just don't understand. I want Chris back. This is not the Chris that I married. And it's just, if you follow just the basic structure of how everything came about, it's incredibly heartbreaking to listen to, to hear her tell it. But if you view it on another angle, you know, let's say that she had come to my office, for example, and said, hey, I, I just want to know what my rights are if I were to get a divorce. And I would talk to her at length about, you know, her assets and things like that, the lawyer stuff, how we're going to divide assets, what custody and visitation orders might look like, and advise her what her rights are going forward. And then she might ask me a question like, is it worth trying to reconcile this? And I would probably tell her then, yeah, it probably is. I mean, you got young kids. If you get divorced, this is what you're going to look for. This is what you're looking at. These are the prospects you're looking at. And it's all of these child custody and visitation orders, child support, alimony, division of property. You're probably going to have to sell that very beautiful home that you have, which may or may not be a big thing. And I would tell her, look, if there's anything you could do to salvage the relationship, now is the time to try because you only get one shot at this. And if it goes bad, then fine. I'm always going to be here. I'm not going anywhere. Divorce is not going to become outlawed anytime soon. And so, Take your shot. If it doesn't work out, then, you know, we'll go for plan B. But plan A is trying to reconcile. And then Chris is over there living up with Nicole Kessinger and doing the whole single guy thing. Midlife crisis, 32 years old thing. When he's, you know, he's like a, I mean, you've seen these guys, I'm sure. They come into the gym and all of a sudden they start lifting weights for like three months. And they're like, oh my goodness, I have definition in my arms. I'm starting to get a six pack and I'm starting that's, to lose all of this weight. And, you know, that's one of those things where you kind of have to like be looking. It's almost like when somebody comes into money, you know, like you see 
perhaps the person will change um, or will get maybe fit. The person might change. And I didn't even consider that. I didn't know if you pudgy before, but if you have that, you're loud. It just, I, when, you know, when uh, working out, maybe their body is just to where they were maybe different size before. They didn't have the, a muscular body. And that one, and yeah, the personality might change a little bit for opportunities. I mean, he might have felt like, wow, I've been on all this um, in combination with a lot. It's almost like when people come in to money, you know, and then their personality changes a little bit. And it's kind of, you know, kind of sad to see. Well, I would have um, advised her like this. I would have said that, hey, maybe he is deciding, maybe, maybe it's a phase that he's going through, you know working out and he's getting in shape or whatever. He wants to explore what his new options are going to be. Maybe he's never had the opportunity to do that before. And I've talked on my Uncle Omar episodes about the dangers of trying to embroil yourself into grown folks business by deciding to get involved in a marriage when you have not explored the upper limits of what you're capable of, of getting as far as options. You know, so here's a guy, he gets married in his younger 20s. Now he's 32. And hey, in eight years, he's going to be 40. And so here's this big chance with Nicole Kessinger, who is not really a prize, but maybe to him it is because it's like, you know, she like, she's like the bright, new, shiny thing. And so it didn't matter if it was Nicole Kessinger or somebody else. He's getting attention from a person that wouldn't normally give him attention. And so now he's all about it. But in that regard, I would have never in a million years have said to Shanann, hey, but you might want to be careful because he might also be a family annihilator. Because I would have said, hey, worst case scenario, he wants to continue this thing with Nicole. He wants to be single, fine, and get divorced, fine. I would have never in a million years say, oh, he might actually choke the life out of you and your two baby daughters for the sake of being a single man. That would have not have been top of mind. That might not have even been on the periphery. And yet it is because he's exhibit a of what is the worst could happen in a scenario like that and so here he is the way that she comes home from like this long trip she's dropped off by her friend and you see like her some of her last moments of life she's walking up she's exhausted she's coming back from a business trip chris has been living it up living the single life of nicole kessinger and she walks into that house And the way that you hear Chris describe it, he gave various different versions of that story that he told the FBI investigators. One version goes like this. We had an emotional conversation about separating and marriage wasn't the best. We had our issues. And he first tries to say, I would never cheat on my wife. Dipshit didn't realize that they had his freaking cell phone where they have all the text messages and pictures between the two of them going back and forth. And so that was lie number one. And then he said, okay, fine. Maybe I did. Maybe I did. And I, I don't, I'm not. And he thought he was making like the big confession. I'd hate to admit it. And, but yeah, I was having an affair with Nicole Kessinger, but I don't know where Shanann is. I didn't kill my wife, whatever. And ultimately after maybe about six hours of interrogation over the span of a couple of days, he finally, he takes this lie detector test. And if you, if you, if you go back and you watch the interrogation, it is one of the most compelling interrogations I've ever witnessed. Not because Chris Watts is all that charismatic or interesting to listen to, but because of the context of it all about this guy and he has no emotional affect and he speaks in vocal fry. You know what that is? It's like where you have like, um, when you speak and your voice is like, like that, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. That's it's really very nice. grating yeah. to listen to, but he does that the entire time. He doesn't know how to project his voice. And he's speaking with the interrogators and ultimately he takes this lie detector test and she's like, oh, 
The good thing about this interrogation is that, or the, this lie detector test is after this is done, everybody's going to be know, to know whether or not you're telling the truth or not. And he's like, okay, fine. Really, what he should have done is not taken that lie detector test. He really shouldn't have been talking to the cops at all. He had no ability. He was just not the smartest guy. But they basically yeah. break him down and he admits to killing his wife and all of these other things. But when he admits to it initially, what he basically tries to say is it was in retaliation to when he discovered that Shanann murdered the children first, which is completely 100% uh, ludicrous. Yeah. But he tries to put it on them yeah, and they're even telling him, it's like, hey, Chris, I mean, are you sure that's what you want people to, to know? That's, that's what you want to tell them? It's like, yes, I did not hurt these girls. And he keeps on trying to spout off that nonsense and they break him down. And then finally he just admits to the whole thing. They had his dad at some point come in and talk to him uh, to kind of uh, quell his anxieties, his fears. And, and they did basically an A plus job in interrogating him. And they did a subsequent. When he revealed that to his dad, yeah, went to his dad. I think that he's not, you know, enough not to know that that interrogation room was under video and audio. Yeah, I think that's when he, you know, revealed what his plan or defense was going to be. <coughs> Is when he was whispering that to his dad that oh, she did it, she did it to them. She you you saw that interview, or that interrogation. Yeah, that short one, right? Uh, yeah, with the dad and the uh, the lie detector test. Like, you're not even shedding a tear, and like not just seconds after that, you hear a sniffle. It's like, um, do you remember in that in the when he's waiting for the results of the lie detector test? How he's he they they had him waiting for like a good hour, hour or two, and then he starts pulling up videos of his kids on his cell phone as he's watching because he knows he's, I'm assuming he knew that he was being recorded and that they were looking at him or observing yeah. him. Yeah. And then he tries to pass off that lie he to did, his dad. He had the stoic thing going about, you know, where you're just unreadable, like that, you know, demeanor. But he puts his he his hands over his head, you know, that one that just makes him look all guilty. Like, you put your hands over your head when you're in a room with, like, four other people. It's kind of like, take a room, and you do that when you see a big accident. Like, oh, gosh. Yeah, he, that was, that was pretty tough. But yeah, he was, he was acting. Well, he thought that he was bad. unreadable, but he wasn't fooling anybody. He was acting about as guilty as he possibly can. In terms of trying to cover up a crime, it's like exhibit A of what you don't do when you're guilty of something and you have no ability to persuade people otherwise. When he's speaking with the officers, he comes back from work and uh, he meets with the officer and he tries to, uh, at this point, they're looking for Nicole. They don't know that she's dead. They don't know what, anything. They just want to know where she's at. And they're just kind of letting him talk. And he gets home. He runs up to this officer, shakes his hand. And then he immediately goes to Shanann's car to like either put something in there or take something out. It's not like, oh my God, where's my wife? Let's call this person. These 10 different people that might know where she's at or no concern. He knew that she was gone, obviously. Yeah. And he wasn't fooling the cop with that. They start trying to canvas some of his neighbors about surveillance footage that existed. It's like, okay, so on surveillance, we see that you left in your truck around 4.30 in the morning. We see Shanann pulling up and we don't see anybody else leave. And they had, they basically had those bases covered. And in one of the most shocking moments in uh, police footage history you see the moment where he's at his neighbor's house and then he's kind of shuffling back and forth and they're watching on his big screen television, the neighbor's big screen television about the surveillance footage that they had on him that was pointed towards Chris's house. They could see Chris's truck backing out of the, or backing up into the garage and then leaving. Because what we know now is he was putting Shanann's body into the back of her truck and then leaving. Chris had no idea what was going to be on that video. You can't see Shanann 
or him putting anything in the back of the truck because he parks it into her garage. But as that footage comes out, you watch Chris in his reaction and he turns like ghost white and he's sweating. He got his sunglasses like falling down off of his face because he's perspiring so heavily. He's got his hands up above his head because he's trying to uh, control his breathing somehow. He's like shifting back and forth. And I don't think, I think at that moment he knew that there was a real good possibility he's about to get arrested for the murder of Shanann Watts. And that, and you put on your, your neighbors, all their cams footage, you pointed at, I think that reaction was really big, but what was interesting is that the neighbor saying, oh, he's not acting. And yeah. I don't know what there was. I mean, I know all of mine. I know their walks. I know their moods. Like, oh, I mean, they're like extended family, you know, if they've been there. And the, he's exactly right. His neighbor called it out. I was like, it's totally obvious. Hey, he's not acting right, man. He's acting, he's like shifting back and forth and basically telling the cops that I think that you need to look at this guy. And uh, yeah, I'm, but I think at that point, they were already kind of on to Chris that he's clearly done something. And then idiot goes on interviewed by media starts uh, putting out these statements. Hey, I just want you guys to come back. I have, but I have no idea where she went. And he just, there's nothing about him in that moment that said grieving husband, grieving father or concerned father, concerned husband. I want to know where my children is. Where's my family. He was just very robotic. And it was, it's not that you have any ability to predict how anybody will react in a crisis. But you certainly have red flags that go off intuitively when somebody's behaving like that. And so... Yeah, there was no what if, what if and worry, right? It was missing. I don't know. Like, what if... If your dog was missing, like all of a sudden you just show up, your dog is not at the house. I mean, I'm assuming that when you're There'd talking to people... If. You would have like a, a hundred different people you would contact and you'd try to canvas the neighborhood, try to find the, out the whereabouts, whatever. I had this when a little peanut disappeared. We were like checking surveillance mm -hmm. and trying to figure out where the dog went. But there was a level of concern there that was just alarmingly absent from Chris when he's talking to law enforcement, when he's talking yeah. to his neighbors, when he's talking to anybody. And so ultimately... <sighs> The difficult part of this case comes in how he recounts the final moments of Shanann Watts and of his children. And it's difficult for me to talk about it even now. And it's been, you know, I've, I've, I've sat with this case now for five years, knowing about Christopher Watts and, and everything that happened. But the way that he recounts it is that night, Shanann gets home. Um, whatever, they have this kind of conversation and it's difficult to know specifically, obviously what happened, but his account was they had, a, they had a talk and ultimately he kind of disclosed that, yeah, I'm seeing somebody else. They ended up, they had sex that night is what Chris said. And then afterwards, when he kind of admits that, yeah, I'm having an affair with this other lady, Shanann says that you're never going to see the kids again. And then he's like sitting on top of her and he decides to choke the life out of her. He says she didn't fight back. And maybe she did or maybe she didn't. But just the, the, the image of her laying on the bed with Chris straddling her waist, both hands around her neck as he strangles life out of her. I couldn't imagine that she didn't fight at all. But he says that she didn't. But he took her life. And it takes a long time to strangle somebody. It's not over quickly. It is an agonizing event that occurs when you're depriving somebody's body of oxygen and they're not even underwater. You're just with your hands. That takes a good number of minutes before the job's finally done. And what must have been going through her mind uh, as her husband is doing this to her and the girls are still asleep in their beds. And who knows what they heard because Chris tells the FBI in this subsequent interview that would have occurred back in 2019 that CC and Bella, I don't remember if it was CC or Bella or both, but they basically go to the room and, and they see Shanann's lifeless body laying on the bed. And it's like, what happened to mom? 
He says, oh, mommy's sick or whatever. And so they were aware that something was going on. And they were upset about it, I'd imagine. And he decides to wrap Shanann's body in a bed sheet and put it in the back of his work truck because he's going to dispose of it somewhere. Where's he going to dispose of it of? Well, there's a, this, this oil tanker facility about, you know, 50 minutes down the road that that's where he was going to do it. And he just kind of left her out in the open air, which was kind of bizarre. Like nobody's going to see that. The contrast between the bed sheets and the terrain was, was obvious. I don't even remember if he tried to like dig a hole or something, but it just wasn't working out. He was just a really dumb criminal. But in the process of all of that, the children are awake around 4, 3.30, 4 or 4.30 in the morning. And you could see very distinctly in the surveillance footage from the neighbor's cam, there's like these little shadows that are following Chris behind or, or following behind Chris, which I've always thought there's, there's no chance that, those, that that's anybody other than Cece and or Bella participating in this act of disposing of their mother's body. And he drives them. He puts them in the car and they drive down to this oil tanker facility and he's going to dispose of mom's body. And as he tells the FBI, he gets there and he's sitting in the car and he's thinking about of what to do. And then he starts with the younger of the two first. He puts a sheet over her head so that she wouldn't see. And then with one hand, he puts his hand around her throat and his other hand over her nose. And he chokes the life out of that little girl. As her older sister is sitting there watching. And when it's done, he proceeds to do the same thing to the oldest, just with his bare hands. Strangles the life out of these little girls. The girls are still on the truck. Okay. Did they ask you what you were doing, taking mommy out, or? Yeah, I don't remember what I told them, but they did ask that. What they, what they say specifically? It was more of like, you know, what are you doing to mommy? Okay. And then the girls, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You mentioned Bella was first. CC is first. Okay. Um, where exactly was she when it happened? In the back seat. Okay. Was she just right next to Bella? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so once again, was it a hand over her face? Was it? It was a blanket over and my hand. And then your hand. Okay. And then so that just stopped her from breathing, type thing. Okay. Did she struggle at all? So, but my, it, I was blocking her face and my hand was right here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You had one hand here and one hand over her mouth. And we're just pushing her against the back of the seat type thing? Okay. What was Bella doing? She was sitting there next to it. She didn't know what was going on. Okay. Could she see you? Okay. Tell me about what you were thinking. I wasn't. I was thinking it's what the path. Yeah. Right, any partial hint of what I feel for those girls and what I feel for my wife, but nothing is, none of this would have happened. So I don't, I wasn't thinking. Okay. So she's in the back seat. Okay. Um, and then once she's gone, then is it Bella next, or is did you pull CC out? I pulled CC out. Okay. So once CC's gone, Bella's still there in the car alive. And then you pulled CC out. What'd you do with her? Okay. So she went into the tank, and Bella was still in the back of the truck alive. Okay. Um, with regard to that tank, did you bring up CC, put her down, open the hatch? Brought her up, opened the hatch. And then put her in. Okay. And then went down to Bella. Tell me what happened there. Said what happened to CC? First, she asked if it was, if it was the same thing, the exact same thing that happened to me as CC. 
Could she ask you that? Okay. So Bella's pretty smart. How did she sound when she asked you that, Chris? She had that that soft voice she always had. Yeah. And what exactly did she say? She said exactly the same thing that happened to me as you see. And then I said, I don't even remember what I said. I don't say if I just said yes like a horrible person or if I just put this put that blanket over her too and did the same thing. Same blanket, same way? Mm-hmm. Okay. She said no. For who? For Nicole Kessinger? Because he wanted to be a single man? And there's been there, there's so much footage of these the, these families. I feel like all their family videos have been released at this point, but like a, a few weeks prior to him doing that, um, you have the girls literally singing songs about my daddy's a hero and, you know, we love our dad. And My daddy is a hero. He helps me grow up strong. He helped me um, snuggle too. He reads me This is their father, and he's decided that in the name of furthering his own interests, their lives should be over. He takes their lifeless bodies up to the top of this oil tanker, and in an opening that's no bigger than eight inches long across, a radius of about eight inches, he shoves their bodies into these tankers full of oil, and thinks that he's going to get away with it. And he tries to convince law enforcement he had nothing to do with it. He tries to convince the world that Shanann was the one responsible for the deaths of his two baby girls. And that's how he chooses to proceed. I mean, he wasn't fooling anybody. Law enforcement was on to him from the very start. But that is the story of Christopher Watts and just the facts that I've detailed to you has had this country embroiled, fascinated with this case because WTF, man. And I'm looking at on my screen a picture of the family. And, you know, he's over here. This could be any family portrait, you know, beautiful wife, beautiful children. And they're sitting here in the backdrop of the some kind of wooded area and the sun's starting to set on the trees and they look like this happy family and he decided to snuff them all out in the name of Nicole Kessinger. I don't know, man. What do you think about all that? It makes no sense, no sense whatsoever. That's like the grossest, evil, treacherous, lecherous, disgusting thing you could even possibly even do. So when I tell you that he might have been possessed by a demon, that'd be one scenario where it was like, yeah, I could see that because there's no way a human being could be capable of such atrocities. I don't know about that. Well, obviously we know yeah. different, but but it's hard to wrap your mind around, right? <sighs> it's it's not this is hard for anybody to stand, but I mean I mean, this is this is tough to hear, to talk about. I don't under I don't understand. I guess that was the last version of him murdering his wife, but I don't understand about making the daughters to get rid of their mom, but to murder your own children has no logic whatsoever. Well, no, there's, there is no logic to it. It's pure, it's pure evil, unadulterated evil. If you wanted to define evil, I would point you to the Christopher Watts case. If you wanted to know what it looked like, that's what it looks like. It's, it's just evil. It's just these bad events occurring with no logic or reason to it other for, than for the sake of it. It needs to exist in the world. You can't have good without evil, some would say. 
someone philosophized that how could you possibly know what's good unless you're able to define what's evil? Which is one way of looking about it. It just makes you really wonder what I'm mean, learning things about this that I, you know, case I did it before. It, it's, it's a lot uglier than even imagined. It is one of the worst so cases the, that we've ever talked about on this show. Yeah. But why would you do that? Well, that's the big question, right? What I was mean, the motive to get rid of your children like that? I mean, I mean, he could have had a lot easier time. I mean, you know, just, I don't know. But yeah, you want to be them, single? You want to go out and explore? Know. You want to do all these other things? Then, then F and go for it, man. Nobody stop. Hey, Shanann will be fine. She would have found somebody else to take care of those children. The girls would be fine. They're going to be yeah. living their life, and children are resilient. They would have got over it. Oh, dad wants to be a dipshit and go explore other women. Fine. They would have reconciled to themselves a point, uh, at, at yeah. some point. But instead, they don't even get the opportunity to do that. Their story ends at dad's indiscretions. And they're playing concerned husband, you know. She just disappeared. Nobody just disappears. If you have two kids and, you know, you have fam friends, you're texting. Nobody falls out of touch. It's just it's not believable. Everybody would have understood infidelity. Everybody would have understood, oh, you got married when you're like 22. Okay, well, maybe he just needs to sow his royal oats or whatever. Or maybe he just needs to go explore whatever. Go find yourself. Where people draw the line is when you start murdering two and four year old little girls with your bare hands, no less. And I, I don't have time for like it on. Part of how, yeah. I, I don't have time for it on well, this show to detail of all meditated? of the. Uh, oh, premeditated? Well, that's, that, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that because. The more that evidence is starting to come out about this case, it appears there might be, a, there may have been a level of premeditation not previously understood, even as Christopher Watts was pleading guilty to the murder of his family. Because it appears that this may, may have been a premeditated plan on the, port, on the part of Christopher and Nicole to rid themselves of this family so that they can go explore their future together. So there's this article that came out. And I'll just read it. So the, the, the account of the murders that I told you was from an inter not interrogation, but it was from an interview from the FBI after he's been convicted of life and all these other things. Of his account of how the lives of Shanann and his two children ended never mind we haven't even discussed but nicole was pregnant with about 12 weeks pregnant with the with their third and so you're, you're talking about the annihilation of four individuals in the sake of his infidelities but that was his story of it but here's another version that came out subsequent so there's this article by dan o'reilly was written in 22 where Chris Watts allegedly told, and this is me reading the article, Chris Watts allegedly told his fellow inmates that his former mistress was responsible for the murders of his wife and children. Watts is currently serving three life sentences without the possibility of parole for the August 2018 murders of Shanann Watts, who was pregnant at the time, and their two daughters, Bella and Celeste. Cece, four and three. That's how old my daughters are right now. It grabs me just a little bit differently reading about this case now as opposed to when I first heard about it in 2018. Because I could not imagine a scenario in, in this universe where I do anything other than protect my little girls. I mean, Jesus, I was just at the, like, the skating rink with them. You know, I'm like, so concerned, like hovering over Olivia so that she doesn't fall and bust her nose on these roller <laughs> skates. I got myself up on those roller skates and I'm rolling around the skating rink, but it was just like at four and three years old, the girls are so full of life and energy and curiosity and it's, everything is magical to them. And I know the role that I play in their lives as their father. They view me a certain way as their protector. And just the thought that somebody could be in my role 
and decide to take their lives like that is so far beyond comprehension for me. It's the most personal I've ever gotten with any of these cases that I've ever covered on this show. And so it, it's, it's hitting me a little bit different. Let me continue with this article before I get too far off track. So David Carter, an inmate who allegedly spent time with Chris Watts while incarcerated at Dodge Correctional Facility in Wisconsin, is claiming that Watts had a different version of events. Carter said that the two were in the same unit. We were on the same unit together, Unit 11. It's for people that can't fit in with the general population and people with medical issues. And as you could imagine, I think people have a, a personal vendetta against Mr. Watts. I don't think that if you put him in general population that he would survive for very long. And indeed, in the interview uh, with the FBI in 2019, he was talking about how people had put threats on his life and wanting to murder him and for the family that he dispatched of, understandably so. Maybe they'll get a chance. Life in prison is a long time. But anyway, Carter claims to have spent a lot of time with Watts, and while the two were discussing the Bible, he asked about the killings and what Watts was thinking at the time. Watts, who had previously admitted to all of the killings after following, failing a polygraph test shortly after the disappearance of his family, said that Nicole, Nicole Kessinger, Nicole, had smothered the girls with their blankets and they suffocated. Watts also claimed that Kessinger had helped him move the bodies to where they were later found by police. Carter says that he was shocked by what he heard from the convicted murderer, who said that he was that he was sad that Kessinger had to kill the girls, saying Chris said it made him feel sad that the girls were killed, but that one of them woke up and saw that Shanann was dead and would be a witness. According to the ex-inmate, Watts couldn't bring himself to kill his daughters, so he had Kessinger kill the girls instead. According to interviews with police during the investigation, Kessinger was under the impression that Watts was separated from his wife and was going to divorce her to be with Kessinger. Kessinger did not seem to know that Watts was still living with his family at the time and the evidence, as well as the fact that authorities did not pursue her suggests that she had no involvement in the killings. It's unclear why Watts would reveal this information at this point, but it seems to be entirely unsubstantiated. Apparently. So, there's 100% no chance that Nicole didn't know that he was still living with his wife. There is evidence out there from Google searches of her literally searching Christopher Watts and his wife, like on Google searches, a year prior to the killings. So this had gone on for a lot longer than what Christopher had led interrogators to believe, than from what Nicole. They brought in Nicole for questioning too. And her version of events made a lot of sense to me at the time mm -hmm. that it was essentially, oh, you know, I, I, I knew he was married. But I thought they were getting separated, and so I was just kind of in the picture. And then I told him at one point that, hey, maybe you should just make things work with your wife. Like, don't worry about me. She's trying to tell the interrogators that. And Chris was in love with me, and so he ended up doing what he did, and I never asked him to do that. This is That's in summation what her story was, right? But there's evidence out there that has not gone all that explored by law enforcement that seemingly circumstantially points to Nicole having a deeper involvement in the murders. And if it was the case that they wanted to dispose of the little girls because one of them might be a witness, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's, it's hard to... I don't know what her background is, you know, Nicole's, but it's hard to even give any credit to him blaming her. It's also hard to believe that he would kill his own children. 
like unless like you know some devil worshiper has troubled you know perhaps mental health or something that she would even that would even think that's a plan you know worth a couple month old fling it's just not well you got to take anything that chris says with a grain of salt i know it's weird for me to say chris because yeah. that's your name but yeah. I'll just say that Christopher Watts also tried to accuse his Shanann of murdering the girls, and now he's trying to put it on Nicole. There might be a thing going on with him where he just doesn't want to believe that he really did that to his girls, and so he's telling himself all of these lies to make himself be able to exist on this plane. Maybe that's a thing. I don't know. But kind of goes back to like the peanut, the peanut thing where, you know, the mom thought it was okay for the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but the peanut allergy. And I think that Shannon had all right to be pissed off about that. Yeah, there, she's just finally be upset. Distance between, I mean, distance between them. They didn't like her because of that. I'll tell know, you what. Maybe uh, Chris is up. If you had a child that had a peanut allergy, and your significant other was like trying very attentively to make sure that they didn't die because of their peanut allergy. And then let's say mom, for example, decided to serve them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, not believing your significant other when they told mom that she had a peanut allergy. What would your reaction be with respect to mom? If she had said, oh, it's being overprotective. It's like, hey, there's no peanut allergy. She's going to be fine. If she says something like that, just stop being a sissy. Squash it right away. I'd say, hey, yes. Or if, if Shanann didn't tell her, believe that she told the mom. So the story goes that basically Christopher Watts mom did not believe that the kids had a peanut allergy, despite Shanann's many warnings about it. Hey, don't feed the girls certain things because they have this allergy. They could die. And then Christopher Watts mom says, you know what? You're being a bit much. Okay. They're going to eat these peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They're going to be fine. Basically putting their lives in danger. This is not, yeah. I would just, you know, this is not okay. I want you to apologize, period. I would Nobody have... In your own time, in your own way, whatever. I know. Yeah. Well, that would be... And she would have been fine with it. It's logical. Well, that's our mom, I mean, right? Our mom do... is wonderful. But Christopher Watts' mom was a little bit different than our mom. And she had this personal vendetta towards Chris, Chris's wife, Shanann. For whatever reason, I don't know what the dynamic was, but it appears that she just highly favored Christopher Watts. He was like a mama's boy. And so Shanann was very much taking that space from her. And she felt a certain way about it. And she treated Shanann accordingly. You know? So. The parents single, I mean, the, I don't know. I mean, they did bring the dad in, but that's also speculatively. We're thinking that Chris revealed his plan to say that he was the wife because she murdered the kids being terrible i mean just in general i'm gonna spend you know? a, i'm gonna spend a few weeks on this topic and so i don't want to get to all of the points that we're gonna hit because we're gonna examine the family dynamic of christopher watts i don't have time to get to it today but we're going to examine it and we're going to talk about all of the evidence in detail that points to nicole being involved in the murders I could just say this, if our mom had that kind of reaction towards my wife in response to my wife saying that our children had some kind of an allergy, I would not have behaved the way that Christopher Watts did, which is basically just, just kind of sweep it under the rug and say, hey, you're just, you know what, we all need to get along. I would probably have a much uh, harsher response to everybody involved but that's what most men do when they're protecting their families and i don't know what right chris is i don't know what his inclination was to try to to protect his family okay yes that's your duty as father to protect your family yeah he couldn't even do it with his own mom involved every single person 
yeah. kids health, kids protection, grandma, mom, dad, cousin, everybody involved. If it's not, if they're not that, then they just don't get access. That's just. Yeah. And it's very easy for a, a person like yourself it, or myself to say, but there was something else yeah, going on with that. And not to get too hung up on that point. There, there is a petition right now on change.org seeking to reopen the criminal investigation against Nicole Kessinger in the Watts murder case. And I want to read it because we're going to explore the claims of this article in subsequent episodes. But this was started by Pamela Thompson, who was a person that's deeply investigated, investigated, invested in this case. Here's what she says. As someone deeply affected by the tragic loss of four innocent lives in the Watts murder case, I am compelled to raise the issue. The case was hastily closed following the Chris Watts confession, leaving significant evidence unprocessed and potential accomplices unchecked, which is 100% true, by the way, because there was no trial in this case. Chris Watts confessed the murder that was good enough for everybody, and so they just kind of left it, right? One such person is Nicole Kessinger, against whom there are serious allegations of involvement in this quadruple homicide case. There is a strong possibility that justice may not have been fully served due to local officials' failure to thoroughly investigate if anyone else was involved. And I will submit that luckily for Nicole, uh, the, the fact that Chris Watts murdered his family and he confessed to it, made a lot of sense to law enforcement, and there was no real need to, to, to really press any further than that. But I feel like just watching the interrogation video between Nicole and law enforcement, that they had some suspicions about her. And there were significant errors made in how they questioned Nicole. And maybe they did it because she wouldn't have agreed to be interrogated otherwise. But they allowed her dad yeah. basically to be there in the interrogation room with her while she's being questioned and didn't even, you know, I mean, normally he, he basically played the role of attorney. It was as if she had an attorney there present while she was being questioned, it just happened to be her dad. And he basically shut down lines of questioning when they started to dig a little bit too deep. And it was very, it, it was very grating to listen to because he wanted them to get to the bottom of things. And they certainly knew things that Nicole didn't know that they knew in the case. We're going to discuss all of that next week. But before, let me, let me continue with this article. The urgency of this matter cannot be overstated. We are dealing with a crime that claimed four innocent lives. The horrendous nature of this case alone demands more than this case was given by local government in the Weld County District Attorney's Office to find and convict all quality, all, all guilty. Let me just say this about this article. It's poorly written. Pamela, I mean, a simple spell check, but there is, there's misspellings, <laughs> there's grammar errors in there, but never mind, I'm reading it. Uh, guilty parties involved. It is our duty as citizens to ensure that all possible avenues are explored. I'm writing this because this is something I care about deeply and it won't happen without the support of people like you. Starting a petition isn't something I would normally do, but I was moved to do so because there was so much evidence overlooked and swept under the rug. I strongly believed that justice has not been served until Nicole Kessinger is truly investigated. There was obvious tampering with evidence and obstruction by deleting of text, there, there 100% was, and numerous other incriminating evidence overlooked in this case, even coming out of the Weld County DA's office. So if you have electronic evidence stored on your phone, just so you know, just because you delete the text messages doesn't mean the law enforcement can't find out what you deleted. So if you, if you text somebody that, Hey, I murdered this person and you know, don't tell anybody delete this as soon as, as soon as you read it, you're not safe. Not only will they find it, but they will print it up and, ex and, and display it as an exhibit at trial. Um, and not only will they know that you texted that, but they'll know that you deleted it because you had a, a guilty conscience. but there has been, there, there was a significant amount of text messages deleted between the two, between Nicole and Christopher Watts. And Nicole's explanation in the interrogation was, oh, I deleted it because I just wanted to forget about Chris and everything because I'm so 
heartbroken over everything is essentially what she said. I just want to move on from my life. So I deleted off my phone. So I deleted, she deleted all of her text messages. And maybe that's the thing. I mean, I don't know, Chris, is that a thing that people do when they break up with somebody? Just delete their text messages and block the number? I don't delete shit. <laughs> I mean, people do. I mean, <laughs> people do like, like delete a contact and stuff. I mean, I don't, I never delete anything. No. By the way, I'm enjoying some Johnny Walker black label, which is not my favorite, but it was gifted <laughs> to me by my assistant, Melissa. And so, uh, I'm, well, that's what we're having today. Well, me by myself, because you're over in, uh, West Hollywood and WeHo or, or even uh, North Hollywood, which was it? <laughs> I live in Hollywood, you fool. I live in, West Hollywood. <laughs> I live in all of the Hollywood, West and <laughs> East, North and South. <laughs> nope. I live in East Hollywood. East but, Hollywood. Um, also, just so everybody knows. In the intro, uh, Omar says, join me as the last thing. And just in case anybody thought he was saying something else, you could let him know in the comments. How I did not that? say, enjoy me. <laughs> I did not say, enjoy me. I don't know who came up with that, but it, I said, join me. Like, join it me for a drink. Attention. Uh, Let's have a whiskey. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> join him. <laughs> All right. Well, let me, uh, let me continue with this article. We must urge the Weld County authorities to reopen their investigation into Nicole Kessinger's potential involvement as an accomplice, obstruction of justice, or tampering with evidence in this case. We owe it to those who lost their lives and their family who continue to seek closure. Please help get true justice for Shanann, Bella, Cece, and baby Nico. Nico was the one that was Shanann, that Shanann was pregnant with. It was going to be Chris's first boy. It is an election year. The only way, the only way change may be possible is to select a new district attorney, local residents of Weld County. All right. She continues on. Anyway, that is the change petition that's been lodged. There is significant evidence that suggests that's not even brought up in this article that Nicole may have been involved. Some of that includes cell phone pings. Nicole's Kessinger's cell phone was found to have been within the general vicinity of the Watts home on the night of the murders. And we'll follow that to what, we, what is known in the discovery on next week's episode. And there, there's other things yeah, as well. I, I think they should open this case. Yeah. I think I agree with the org petition. I think that there's a lot here. It seems like it was perhaps hastily closed. I mean, if, if she's pinging at the residence, in the evening you know maybe she was there in the morning during the before the wife got home perhaps but if it's in the evening i mean you got to be kidding me well i mean yeah there's a lot more to unpack i'm gonna push back on that a little bit in so far as if there was significant evidence that pointed to nicole kessinger i don't believe the da would have just shut the book on it I just think they didn't have enough, not even to bring her up on charges. Cause it's going to be like, I'm assuming they have all the physical evidence. I'm assuming that they, the physical evidence points to nobody other than Christopher Watts being responsible for the murders. I'm assuming DNA evidence has been examined and I have not looked at all of the physical evidence in depth, but we're going to explore that next week. But assuming that the physical evidence only points to Christopher Watts, the circumstantial evidence about the cell phone pings, there's not a lot of DAs that are going to bring charges just on the strength of a cell phone ping for a lot of the same reasons that are, that are happening in the Brian Koberger case. Are you familiar with that case? The one that the Idaho murder murderer that killed four people as they lay asleep in their college dorm in Idaho. Well, yeah, yeah a little bit. Yep. Long story short with that. A lot of the probable cause affidavit speaks about cell phone pings and him being in the general vicinity. And his defense attorney has poked a lot of holes in that saying, yeah, that's like within like a 50 mile radius. And he lived like 13 miles away. Those numbers aren't accurate, but that's pretty much what our argument is. And so there's, that's not really anything really to speak of because he could have pinged my cell phone. And I, I would have been in the general vicinity based on the radius 
of how the cell phone pings. So that might have been a thing. So just because the DA has decided to close the investigation doesn't mean that they didn't look at her. It just means that they didn't have or they don't have enough evidence to convict. And maybe it is the case that they there was an insufficient investigation. I don't know. I don't put a lot of weight behind Christopher Watts speaking to his cellmate to yeah. suggest that Nicole was responsible for the murders of his children. That more or less sounds like a guy that doesn't want to have that on his conscience, and so he's trying to convince himself that it wasn't him. But that makes sense. We're going to get into all of that next week. This week is more or less an introduction into the tenor of the Christopher Watts case and what we're going to be discussing in subsequent weeks. And so we have that to look forward to. I don't want to get too deep into this episode today. I just wanted to share with everybody my candid thoughts and why I have waited so long to cover this case specifically. And I'm covering it now because my family structure 100% parallels Christopher Watts' family structure. His kids are now the same age as my kids when they lost their lives at the hands of their father. It just hits me a lot different. And I felt the need to cover it. Not only that, we had a poll, people voted, and so this is what we're going to do. So with that, any closing thoughts on this introductory episode of Christopher Watts? I mean, I'm just, I'm highly intrigued and, you know, what's to come because it just doesn't make sense, you know? How, How the hell could you do that to your kids? It almost feels like there has to be something more, you know, that makes sense, which, yeah, it does lead to like looking around. Yeah. Well, what was him and I guess the mistress, I mean, she may have nothing to do with it besides a love affair. And I, I do want to understand what the hell was in your mind. And so, yeah, I think there is a lot more to unpack. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, We're going to get to all of that, so you're going to want to stay tuned for uh, subsequent weeks as we discuss the intricacies of the Christopher Watts case and whether or not Nicole Kessinger was involved, whether or not we should reopen the investigation to try to convict her of her role in the murder of Christopher Watts' family. But before we do that, I think it's time to pull down. I think it's time to bring in some Purple Haze. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time to bring in some purple haze with Uncle Omar as I answer your family law questions. And by the way, we are in talks right now with potential sponsors for this show. But as a part of that, we're thinking about opening up the lines, perhaps on a Patreon, perhaps on other things. But for right now, it's completely free. If you have scenarios, or situations that you want me to speak on and give you my family law perspective, give you some advice from a family law attorney on your personal situation, then DM me, I would say on Instagram, but my Instagram got hacked. And so I don't know what's going on with it. I'm trying to recover it. But for right now, contact me on TikTok and leave me in the DMs, the situation that you want me to analyze and explore. And we will do that on a subsequent episode of... Purple Haze with Omar Serrano. I don't know if it's good. Hey, Dominic, what are we calling this segment now? Is it Purple Haze with Omar or is it Uncle Omar or is it Family Law After Dark? What are we doing with this segment? Uh, family Law After Dark. Hey, Chris, what do you think? Family Law After Dark? Is that is that the, the winner? I mean, I, I, I mean, if you want to do Purple Haze, it's like, okay, I'll smoke a joint with my attorney. Sure. I mean, <laughs> <it's up to you. laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm in favor of the the purple the 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 family law after dark. I pitched that to Eliana like a year ago, and we haven't really done anything about it until like well, a few weeks ago. So, this first inquiry comes to us, and they have they're they're looking for post-divorce advice and plans for the future. And so, Chris, I'm coming at this from a family law attorney perspective, and you could just come at it with 
your layperson's perspective, whatever you have to say, whatever your opinions are, are fully welcomed. But this is what they have to say. So, still very fresh, and I'm still very sad, but I have to plan for my future and my kids' future. I'm living in my ex-father-in-law's house with my son. Him and I are going to work up a contract allowing me and my son to stay here until he is 10. About two years. Or I guess for, I guess for about two years. So I guess her son is eight years old and she wants to be there for a couple of years. Fine. Uh, so obviously I want to save every last penny, but should I look ahead with plans to buy my own place or continue to rent? I really don't want to rent for the rest of my life and I want to leave my son with something when I die and any advice would be really appreciated. Well, a young lady, I would advise you that if you have the opportunity or the ability to do so, purchasing is a lot better than renting if you can pull it off. I would also caution you that you are living, the idea of you coming into a contractual agreement with your father-in-law, the father of your ex-husband, is a little disconcerting, and I'm not sure the enforceability of it all, unless you're just strictly, he's just strictly having you sign a lease where you're going to be here month to month or for a two-year period, and you're going to pay a certain amount of rent. That's fine. But just be very careful about contracts that you make with family, because if it's for money, that's one thing. You can make a contract with family. You can make a contract with anybody. If there is an offer and there is consideration for the offer and there's consent to the offer, all that's fine. He says you could live here for a couple of years, but you're going to pay me $24,000 over the course of two years for rent. Well, that's a, that's a contract and that there are definable terms in that and it's enforceable in any courts, regardless of what your family relationship is to that person. It's just a weird dynamic. I don't know. What do you think hmm. about that, Chris? You're moving into your, this person that you just divorced into their, your in-law's house and you're paying them money. What is that? Does that does does that come on? Do you get any red flags from this setup? And so she has an eight year old child. Eight year old child. She wants to. She wants to be there till she's he's ten. I mean, there's not a problem with that. But if she does have the opportunity, the credit, and the ability, like you know, like a pre approval with you know, and can make an offer that's complete that competes with other offers and get any type of, even a one bedroom. Well, I mean, or whatever she should do that. Well, That's the thing is, best interest. here's my concern from a family law perspective. So I don't know if there's going to be a custody or visitation fight mm. between her and her ex-husband. But in the event that there is, and one of the parameters to that, or one of his arguments, is that I should have full custody of my son because she doesn't have stable housing. She's literally living with my step or, or with my father on charity, and he can't afford to let her keep that place. In other words, if it's like, hey, he could be pulling in 4000 a month in rent, and he has this deal with her where she's only paying him $800 a month. He can't financially hold up to that, and so he's going to have to get rid of her eventually, and therefore she's going to be homeless. I need to have full custody of my son. He can make an argument like that, and then Sounds she's going to have plot. to have— Well, I've seen it, I've seen yeah. it happen <laughs> many times. That's if often an living argument. living there on charity, and he wants to introduce a lease contract, and he's going for full custody— it's a plot. Look, if he's going to enter into a into a written agreement where he's going to give you an offer for rent that is below fair market value for that facility, and it's in writing, and he signs it, and you sign it, it's a binding contract, so it's not really an argument to make. And then if he tries to kick you out, you're going to have various other legal recourses to fight against him if that's a concern. I mean, that's that's one mm -hmm. part of it, yeah. Um, and so, look, if you're going to do something like that and it's between family, don't make the mistake of saying, oh, yeah, you can just stay here as long as you want and you don't have the order, the, the offer in writing. Here's what's going to happen. In the United States, generally, specifically in the state of California, 
When you don't have a contract with definable terms, or for example, you have a contract that should be in writing, but it isn't in writing, or it's only enforceable if it's in writing, but you too have been behaving as if you have a contract, the court is going to look to fill in the gaps. And one of the ways they're going to do that is like, well, how much are you paying for rent? Well, I don't know. It's just kind of an agreement between the two of us. Like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. What's the fair, what is the fair market value of that unit? And then it's going to be a certain amount. And they're going to be like, it's, it's unconscionable to suggest that this person could charge $4,000 a month of rental income to any other person. And they're going to just give it to you for $1,000 a month. And what rule does that make sense? He's got to earn a living too. You got to look at the receipts. So obviously you shouldn't be paying by cash. I mean, she's not, she's, yeah. she's smarter than that. Keep that in writing. So she's giving $400 and then the next month it's going to be $500. And then the next month, maybe you skip and then it's going to be $800. That's just, I mean. No, you got to have defined terms. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So well, write, up, write up a full lease. Yeah, it, it, that's proper. That's proper. Correct. Yep. Have it be for 24 months. Protect both parties. Have, yeah. the, every, have every month uh, create a, a, a specific amount due to the landlord who's going to be your father-in-law. And if you want to do that, then fine. I mean, if you're okay with that fi- family dynamic, I mean, I'm assuming you have a good relationship with father-in-law. I'm not asking too many questions. Do we know how much that, that he agreed to charge her? Is it no, and it, it doesn't value, or is it? It, it, okay, it doesn't so really that's matter. A big, that's a big thing. Yeah, it only matters. So the dollar amounts are not important. What's important is, and whether you might have a potential for uh, future uh, trouble, is if he's letting her stay there for far below fair market value. And you don't have that agreement in writing. So all she really has to do to protect herself is make sure whatever the agreement is, get it in writing, have an attorney drop a a base contract. They could do that pretty cheap, a couple hundred bucks or whatever, and make it be a legit lease. Like if I don't pay this money, he could evict me. Or as long as I'm paying this amount, then I could stay here legally because you could do that wherever. And if, if it is an agreement like that, where he's trying to help you out, where he's letting you stay there below fair market value, as long as it's in writing, you should be fine. But if you don't have it in writing, then, oh, there's so many bad things that can happen. And I'll just kind of leave it at that. But th- that's my advice to her. Just whatever you're going to do, if you're going to do something like that, fine. Do it in writing. Let's move on to the next one. So this next person is looking for what is my advice to have an amicable divorce. And so I have a lot to say on that topic, but let's, here's what she's going through. So I'm in the process of separating. We're not married from my significant other of 10 years and father of ch- 10, well, and my father of children. This is poorly written. From my significant other of 10 years and father of my children this is what she's trying to say. It started off quite emotional and very upsetting, but we seem to have worked our way through a lot of anger and are now both on the same page that we are just not right for each other, but are still actually good friends. I guess I don't understand what she's asking me about an amicable divorce for if they're not actually married. They've just been together for like 10 years. But I will continue. He hasn't moved out yet, but we agree that it will be him that goes, probably when lockdown has eased a little. I'm just hoping to get some advice from people who've gone through this so we can do our best to keep it amicable. Not just for the kids, but that's a big enough motivation, but also because I really want him to still be my friend at the end of all of this. In hindsight, part of the reason we got together and stayed together was a mutual feeling of loneliness in the world. Like two, okay. She, she, it seems like she's asking too much. You no, I don't think she's asking too much. Best friend, you could be amicable with somebody. Well, maybe. You... Well, well, we're talking about platonically, but like it seems like she might be asking too much. It's like maybe. I don't, know. I don't have experience in this in this realm, but you know, <laughs> things are going to change. She has to accept that. You know, I mean, you're splitting, which, you know. I guess you guys should just focus on the kids. Maybe that's the answer. If you guys can, yeah, I think that that would make both of them happy. I'm assuming if they're both, their goal is to keep the kids safe, happy, and the best thing for the kids, they're going to stay friends. Well, 
I'll tell you this. Yeah. Whenever you're divorcing somebody or you're getting out of this long arrangement and there's children involved, you can be amicable, but that requires a great deal of maturity on both sides. Here's what normally happens. Like 99% of the time when people get divorced, there are these severe feelings of hurt that you have to contend with that usually color the lens through which you view your ex-husband or wife. And then that colors how you treat them in a co-parenting relationship. And, you know, and really that's the only time that you really have to continue to communicate with each other. Because if you get a divorce and divide the assets, you have no reason to talk to them ever again. But when you have kids, you're kind of stuck with that person for the next 18 years or until your child turns 18 or you no longer have children that are of minor age. So that can be done. But the only way that it, that you can possibly do that is if you get over all of the bad feelings that you have towards each other. Now, this is her speaking. And she's saying that everything is fine. And then she says, she, has, she says this interesting statement at the very end. Part of the reason we got together and stayed together was a mutual feeling of loneliness in the world. Like two fish bowls, two, like two fishes swimming in the, how's that song? What's, what's that song? What am I thinking of? Dominic, what's that song? Two goldfish swimming in the fishbowl year after year. It'll come to me. Dominic will put it up on the... <laughs> the hell are you listening to? <laughs> it's, a, it's an older song. Yeah, ah, who was, who sung much. that song? I'm telling you. Well, here's the thing. I don't know if she's asking too much or not. I don't know what his perspective is. They're in the process of separating. I'll tell you why she's asking too much. I'll tell you why. Because if the relationship, if they're going to split up, they're splitting up. Her loneliness theory is out the window. If they're going to split up, they're splitting up. Yeah. If it's not based on the kids, then when she gets a boyfriend or he gets a boyfriend or whatever the hell, when jealousy sets in, that that friendship is is doomed. At least, you know, there's the hurt. So you have to have the homeostasis of it's about the kids. Not homeostasis, about the two huh? Because you guys are splitting up. You can't have it both ways. Well, listen to what she says. She says, they start off quite emotional and very upsetting, but we seem to have worked our way through a lot of anger and are now both. So there's clearly some anger and stuff. I don't know from his perspective if if he was with her for because he was lonely. She might have been her, 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 she might have been his forever person, you know? And now she's trying to shock it up. Oh, the only reason I was, I was with him is because I was lonely. You're so you're right. She might be delusional in that degree. And, but she clearly says that things were emotional at the beginning. Very upsetting. We both have worked our way through a lot of anger. I don't know what, what that anger comes from. But we are now both on the same page and that we're just not right for each other. And we're still actually good friends. If they're good friends, all right. I don't know what good friends means. Does it mean like they're friend, like she's friend zoning him or they're both friend zoning each other? Because the way that she describes it, I suspect this. I suspect that she's the one that wanted this divorce and he's kind of going along with it because this is what she wants. And he's tried to get her back together. And there's been a lot of back and forth between the two of them. And now he's kind of just acquiescing to, you know what, I'm just going to fine, but we could still be friends. And so maybe he still does. He still have designs on getting back together with her or is this just her imagination that he's just okay with, with this setup? There's a lot of unanswered questions here, but I'll just say this. If she- if she wants to be friends, if she wants to end up as friends, when you break up, you, I'm friends with all my exes, but there has to be. I am not friends with all my exes. (laughs) Well, good for you on that. There has to be a a cool off period and then you can be friends. So you're not going to make it through that period unless you focus just on the kids. You will land on friends, but don't think that you guys, that there's not going to be this yearning and sadness. He's not going to be there to, talk to you over your loneliness that you're, you know, no, you can't have it all. Look, if you're going to divorce, divorce, make it about the kids. You'll end up as friends. Well, I'll tell you what, what if you want it to be amicable, the only real way to do that is you got, you have to get rid of all romantic notions 
And then it has to be on both sides. It can't be like every time you go, he comes to pick up the kids, he's like talking to you about your life. Because as soon as you get like a boyfriend or as soon as he gets a girlfriend, if there's like unresolved feelings between the two of them, that's going to interfere with the co-parenting relationship. And now we're not looking at something that's amicable for the sake of the kids. Now we're looking at, you know, reintroducing broken, hurt feelings between the two of them. And I'm just going to assume that he probably and has you know designs. How, what type of rejection that the kids feel after that when yeah. they realize that the parent was only there for the other parent, they were never there for the kids? Well, Don't that's that a big too. part of it, isn't it? That's like a, and that's why a lot of family courts say that, hey, we're going to do this in the best interest of the children. And there, there's sometimes like these orders that they'll put in the, look, you're not to talk negatively about the other parent. You're not to call the other parent for anything other than reasons involving the children. Because what happens, I see a lot of these cases, they'll use the exchanges to establish communication with the other parent or with the mom. They're trying to get back together, ask them about who they're dating, try to get into their personal life and all that kind of stuff. And who, when exactly what you just said happens. The children end up feeling rejected because it's like, so the only reason you're, like, you're picking me up is because you're trying to get back with mom or you're trying to get back with dad. And so I'm just like- Or, a, they, or they stop because they get jealous and then, and then they realize it was never about me. It was you were, yeah. Yeah, and then there's no amic there, there's there's nothing amicable about a situation like that. And so for this young lady, I would just say that look, I I feel like she's looking at this very optimistically and that's good and all, but she also has to look at it realistically. Her interpretation of the relationship, I 100% guarantee you does not match his interpretation of the relationship. And the fact that they're still friends, that's not really a common thing. Like you could have a cooling down period and all that kind of stuff when there's no attachment, there's no children or whatever. And you like find each other years after the fact, or like you said, you're just, you're, yeah, you're friends now. Or whatever. Yeah. 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 I'm just talking about being like, you know, cordial and, you know, you still have love for them, but yeah, you just. Well, I can tell you this. Them. That there is no relationship I have with any ex out there in the world of mine where I'm just going to be friendly and like have like a normal communication with them because number one, it's not appropriate. And number two, you've shared that space together and it didn't work out. And so what's there left to talk about? I don't need to be your buddy. I'm 43 years old. I got enough friends in my life. I don't need to add a ex-girlfriend, A, B, C, or D to the list of friends. Same goes with, you know, ex-boyfriends or whatever. There's no reason to carry on unless you have children and you have to. And when you resume a relationship like that, and it's not about the children, it's just so easy for lines to get blurred and for that to confuse everybody, not just the parties involved, but the children, the current significant others. It's just, it's all bad. And so her question was this, how do I keep it amicable? Keep it 100% about the children and about nothing about else. Yeah. Don't ask him about his personal life. Don't tell him about your personal life. He doesn't need to know about boyfriends, whatever, a uh, new love interest. You don't need to know about his. Inevitably, you may decide or have uh, designs on getting remarried to somebody. That's, gonna, that's inevitable. And in that case, then fine. You bring it up then. But you shouldn't be regularly dis talking about your private life to this person. They no longer share that space with you. And deciding to go into that area is just asking for trouble. You're asking for the opposite of an amicable separation. You're asking for a heavily litigated custody and visitation trial is what you're asking for. Because that's going to be like, hey, I don't want my children being around this guy. He's got a criminal record. And, you know, my children told me some things about she's scared of him and all this kind of stuff. And now we have to explore whether or not this new person, this who is probably completely innocent, is we have to just litigate whether or not he's actually a danger to the children or somehow counter to their well-being. It gets really ugly really fast if you want to play it that way. So proceed with caution and start to, you don't need to be friends with this guy. You got kids together. You can't be friends, not the same way that you used to be. He's not your buddy. You guys have shared fluids together. 
You guys literally have these children together. You made people together. There, there is no world where you're going to have this platonic relationship and expect everything to be amicable. It's not. And so that's what I have to say to this young lady. Uh, do you got anything to add, Chris? Nope. Before I get too <laughs> nope, dramatic with it? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's correct. I mean, sorry, it's not a answer that I think that maybe she was searching for. There, there's a way to have it, everything, but you can't. Well, I'm not but here to tell her what she wants to hear. Course. I'm here to tell her what she needs to hear because that's this, this what I do. And that's this what people pay me a lot of money for. This other one, and we're going to end with this, but he wants to know whether or not he should reconcile or divorce with his wife. And he wrote me a book. So I'm probably not going to read the whole thing, but let's just get the background. So he says he's looking for sincere advice about whether to reconcile or divorce. And he says that I'm a 43-year-old married man to a 39-year-old woman for the past 11 years. Hey, he's my age. Together, been together for 14 years. We got a couple of kids, eight and five. We are both successful professionals. We work hard, make good money, and are active in our community. Our friends jokingly call us the power couple. Neither, nobody calls you that, dude. Uh, neither of us will have trouble getting <laughs> dates if we break up. <laughs> Um, yeah. on December 1st, I discovered that my wife was having an affair that began in early November. Although the affair was brief, it was intense and spiraling out of control. When I stopped it, my wife fell hard for her affair partner. And there is almost no possibility that they would have ended it themselves until their relationship ran its course. She was infatuated with him on the road to following and falling in love. Her affair partner is also married with children. My wife and I are best friends with another couple who in turn are also close friends or neighbors with the affair partner and his wife. And as a result, we would often hang out with affair partner and his wife when visiting our mutual friends. My wife and affair partner always had an intense mutual attraction, but they behaved appropriately around each other. So I never picked up on it. So right off of the bat, right off the bat, um, my advice to this guy is 100% divorce, run from the heels. Uh, she just off the basis of how he even knows all of that. lets me believe that this is like some weird cuck relationship that was born about her admission <laughs> That's what I was thinking, yeah. About that she's that. having an affair and he's just story. cool with that. Right. If my wife told me something like that, I'm so far, I'm already in the mountains. <laughs> it's like, well, sh good luck with all of that. I will cut you a check. I will be so far gone because she has zero respect for this guy. Either he, I don't know how he found out about the attraction between the two of them being that strong. I feel like yeah, that really must fun. have come from her mouth. Or he maybe he logged into her uh, her tablet was hooked up to her iMessage. Yeah, but most knows, normal people but... that they found out that way they don't they they don't talk this civilly. It, it almost feels like he's enjoying typing this out as I'm reading it. But let me let me let me just. All right, so he he, he talks Reconcile about these or divorce. Hmm. Did they have kids? The forty three and 40, 39? 10 and eight. Oh no, I'm sorry, eight and five. Eight and five. So he just the he, other couple has kids also. Shoot. Yeah, it's this whole weird like it feels like this weird Hollywood couple dynamic where it's like this weird sex thing. I don't know, I Chris. The kids are friends what do you think too. Think about that. Uh, I wouldn't know much about that, but she unless unless one of the families moves, I would say get a divorce. If a family moves, I mean, you've been married for fourteen years. Together for 14, married uh, for 11. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good. Um, but before you continue time. with your answer, um, let me, let me, let, we need to, mm -hmm. we need to have all the information. So he writes in detail about five separate encounters between his wife and her affair partner. He talks about them crossing boundaries. 
He says, my work is fairly cushy about 75% of the time, but it's all consuming and miserable about 25% of the time. These periods are difficult for my wife because she works hard herself and essentially becomes a single mom when I am in the grind. I was going through one of these difficult patches at work in October, November. I had just returned home from a week-long work trip across the country, and we visited our best friends, the couple who are also friends or neighbors with a fair partner and his wife. I went to bed early that night because I was exhausted from a difficult week of work. Everyone else stayed up drinking and several people got into the hot tub where a fair partner crossed boundaries with my wife. AP secretly rubbed my wife's crotch. This actively lasted about five minutes until my wife got out of the hot tub. The transgressive and clandestine nature of it must have thrilled them. You see how he's writing, though? Like, this is not a guy that found out his wife, his wife is cheating on him. Like, he has indulged in this story. He's, like, writing it like a novel. And so he's... Well, we don't know his tone. He could, he could be, like, mad about it, like, stewing, too. But maybe he did. Maybe he's liking it. Yeah. All right. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. And not, not, there's no, nothing wrong if you want to... If, if this is your thing. I'm just... He doesn't appear to be all that upset about it at all. Okay, so encounter number two at a hotel bar. At the hotel bar, a fair partner apologized to my wife for his inappropriate behavior. When she assured him that she was not offended, he proposed an affair. Fair partner noted that he and my wife were well matched because they both had a lot to lose, presumably a reference to their respective families. My wife agreed to an affair. They spent the next 30 minutes making out. How does he know that is my question. Unless she told him or he's making it up. Encounters three and four oh, were in a hotel. Sorry, I masturbated you in the spa, but would you like to have an affair? Was that the conversation? Well, it's just saying that, hey, we both don't have a lot to lose. And so might as well have an affair. And she says, all right. And then they make out for 30 okay. minutes. Encounters three and four were in a hotel. You could use your imagination on that one. Encounter five is in our vacation home. We had a vacation home about an hour and a half away. That is my happy place. It is peaceful and comfortable with a romantic vibe. I understand with my, my wife thought to invite AP there, though this decision is itself a betrayal. Like many vacation homes, we have a smart lock that allows us to open the door remotely for contractors or visitors, but it also keeps record of whenever the door opens, including whether the door opens from the inside or outside. We have a ring camera. My wife said she wanted a big day by herself at our vacation home, reasonable request, given that she was essentially a single parent. However, something about this trip was off. Even if I couldn't explain it, this was the first time I sensed anything amiss. However, I reassured myself and wondered why my wife was playing tricks on me. Then I realized that she was disabled, that she disabled the ring camera upon arrival. And that's when I panicked. My kid has an iPad. He uses it for homework. This iPad is linked to my wife's Apple account, meaning it contains information from her phone. This allowed me to access her search history and discovered that two nights earlier, she searched best sex albums. Two weeks before that, she searched for best quiet bars. And she even explored how much rooms cost when the hotel bar was located. I only realized she was having an affair when I saw this search history. I noticed on the app connected the smart lock of my vacation house that my wife opened the door. And then he goes into details. So that, so all right, five separate encounters that he knows about. Confrontation. My wife comes home the next day and is genuinely warm and loving. I can see in her eyes she was happy to see me. I remained stunned and confused and desperately hoping there was some misunderstanding. I noticed that her work calendar had a hold until 1230 the previous day, co coinciding with somebody potentially leaving at 1235. Late that night, I got up and accessed her phone. I got into her WhatsApp where I noticed a series of calls between her and AP, including some just before 1011, presumably when she gave him directions to our vacation house. That is how I learned AP was the third party. I woke up my wife and confronted her at two in the morning on Friday, December 1st. She admitted everything. Though she minimized the depth of her feelings for AP, she originally told me that she did not really care for him and planned to break it off the following week. All right. So aftermath, I gave my wife through the weekend to conclude things with AP and then cease communication to which she agreed. I told her if she communicated again, I would leave her. We both started weekly individual counseling as well as weekly marriage counseling. We are both reading Getting Past the Affair, 
required reading for anyone in our situation. We also hired lawyers to negotiate a post-nuptial agreement, fair to both parties. That's a good idea, actually. But the post-nuptial process proved stressful. On December 14th, my wife called AP from her office and talked to him for five minutes, seeking his advice regarding the post-nuptial. AP is a smart guy, though hardly a financial analyst, so her calling him for advice was a pretext for emotional connection and perhaps disclosure. Okay. He goes on to talk about earlier infidelity. He talks about the marriage context, and then he writes a conclusion. So I'm an optimistic person by nature. I'm grateful for the many blessings life has afforded me, starting with health for me and my family. My kids must always be my top priority as the child of divorced parents. I hope to spare my children that what I endured, although my wife betrayed me, I feel like I failed. I resent my wife for putting me in a situation in which I must prioritize my children because she neglected to consider them a stunning lapse from an otherwise great mom. I dislike all my options moving forward. Aside from the notable lies regarding calling her a fair partner in mid-December, my wife has otherwise embraced reconciliation. I need to decide whether to reconcile a divorce I don't know, Chris. What, what do you think I'm going to say? What does she want? Well, I mean, honestly, it does sound like it's pretty dang over, but I mean, he, it's, it's probably genuine that he does want, not want to do that to his kid, you know, be another divorced family. But what does she want? Because without her, whatever, it doesn't matter what he wants. If she's still in love with this guy, which they're best friends, their kids are probably best friends or play or whatever. They're going on all these trips. Like, you know, they've, been on this long thing she's cheated before and who knows what he's done this is one side it's hard to say without what she says assuming that she is still you know will say anything right now but she still has the hots for this guy it seems it's hard to pry this this family even apart <laughs> which is more messy it seems like their whole life is established around their best friends which wow i don't know about this one man this is this is one's tough i don't know dominic what do you think i'm gonna say oh you could just shout it out they know you're not on mic uh they definitely need a divorce yeah break that off <laughs> almost instantly well i'll tell you what um let's let's what does it look like if if he stays with her Chris, Dominic, let me just ask you this question. Is there any world where you can foresee that this lady has any modicum of respect for her husband going forward? Uh, I, I, would, I would see that the behavior would repeat itself. She doesn't respect him. I would think. She's gone through all of these details with her, either at his request because he sounds, he just sounds like a cuck or I, I don't know, but there's something weird about how this guy has phrased everything and, and, and about his ability to just kind of just justify a lot of his wife's interaction. Look, if you were a man who values yourself as the protector of your family, then part of the thing that you're protecting the family from is infidelities, both on your own part and from your wife. And if your wife has not only crossed those boundaries, but had five separate encounters that you are aware of, and she's told you all about it, about how she was so excited about, you know, and then the attraction was so strong and, you know, she's tried to justify it to you, whatever. And you go back as the man and the protector in that relationship dynamic, whatever you think of gender roles, if the man goes back and just says, you know what, it's okay. It's fine. We, we'll all stay a family and everything's going to be fine. Then there's no chance in hell that she's ever going to respect you as a man of value such that she doesn't have to worry about what she does. You're always going to be there because you're a cuck. She and in that dynamic, money. I don't know anything about her. She's yeah. a successful professional. She has her own money. She doesn't need his money is what it sounds like. She's not worried about, she's willing to sign a post-nuptial agreement, meaning she's not looking for his money. She's got her own, so good for her. But if he's expecting her to be this doting, loyal wife, she's already not that. And so 
screw it. You got the post nup, leave. The children will get over. They're old enough. They'll be fine. But if you think that if you think that there is a world where she's all of a sudden going to be this loyal wife, which is clearly what he's looking for, that is never going to cheat on him, that is, you know, going to be remain faithful no matter what and be this wonderful mom. She could be a good mom without being faithful to you, clearly. And the fact that he's not even taking it more serious is red flag number one. Maybe this is all all this subtle plan where he just wanted her to think that everything was going to be okay, where he gets her to sign this post up where they get to walk away with their own property that's in their names. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. But if he genuinely th- believes that there is any scenario where she has any shred of respect for this man going forward, no matter what happens, because it's one of two seven scenarios. It's either this. Either she says that, you know what? I got away with that. And he was so understanding about it. I guess there really aren't any consequences to me going out and screwing around. And then she continues to do the same thing, probably with the same guy, maybe with somebody else. Because she's going to be going through her midlife crisis at 39, 40, 42, 45, whatever it is. And if she wants to explore that, she wants the openness to do that, you've clearly not given her any consequences for it. And she doesn't respect you enough to honor your wishes. Or number two, let's say she tries to stay faithful to this guy. She really does. But can she ever really look at him the same way as like the man that's supposed to be protector and the shepherd of the family, knowing that he allowed her to get away with such things without any consequence? Because most men that are worth anything will say, the hell with that. There's no chance. Look, A, I have value. And if you're going to do something like that, you're not good enough for me. So I'll get over it. You do you. And I'm going to move on and do me. And we'll still raise the kids and all that, but I owe nothing to you. That's what most strong men in that scenario would say. They wouldn't be expounding through this this mountain of literature about all of her five different encounters that he knew, about how she was so infatuated with him. And, you know, maybe that's his way of getting through it, but he's putting it out there with the world for the world to see. And asking, hey, all of this stuff in detail about what he's been through and all of the things that his wife went through with uh, her affair partner. How could she possibly look at him as the strong man that she is desiring that protects the family if he's, he's willing to give not. in all of that? Yeah. Yeah. And if there's no respect. Here's the advice. All right. Let's hear your advice. Uh, okay. So. Even if those families separate, if he can't stomach her doing it again, then get a divorce. If you can, and you got to ask yourself if you can, and it sounds like he's looking for us to say reconcile or you to say reconcile. If you can stomach, stomach it, don't bring it up again and keep on living your happy life and just assume it's happening. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's going to be one of those, oh, I stay together for the kids. But then it's going to be basically become like an open relationship. Well, she's doing her thing. I'll do my thing. If you want to do something like that, then fine. Have an open relationship with her. Just say, look, I'm going to stay together because I don't want to break up the family unit and what we have going on. But you do your thing. Just know that I'm going to do my thing. You can try to do that. Fine. See how long that lasts. It's not realistic because it almost never works out. But you well, try to go that, into we it. We don't know the statistics on that. We don't know what goes on behind I can tell you, I don't know the statistics. I can just tell you from, I can tell you from doing family law for 10 years that people that have tried to do the open relationship thing, almost inevitably, it just, it ends up badly. Those are usually yeah. the cases like 50% of the time. These, these are my statistics from my own cases. It ends up in some kind of domestic violence situation. It ends up in somebody in therapy. It ends up in orders that the children go to therapy because of all the crazy stuff that their parents are doing and putting them through. It's never pretty. Does it work sometimes? Yeah, sure it does. But in those cases, it's like, look, we're going to do this until our children turn 18 and then we're going to get divorced. But it's never like with the hope of Oh, we're going to have a, we're going to live happily ever after. And so the bonds have already been broken. She either never had any respect for you or she's never going to have respect for you going forward. Either way, 
your value as a man to her is substantially small. And what she desires is clearly not you. It's dipshit affair partner over there. And if it's not him, it's going to be some other guy that resembles the tenor of some guy that she's dreamed up or seen in the movies or seen in whatever, or whatever is her fascination at the time. But it ain't you, buddy. Or maybe she just needs more. Maybe she just needs a variety. And that's just it. If you could deal with it, then deal with it. Yeah. If you really can't, then yes, you got to, you got to get a divorce. Clearly this guy can't because, you know, he says, he talks about boundaries and things and he's not talking about, oh, well, maybe I'll go explore my affair partner or whoever, some other girl. He's not talking that way. He's talking like, oh, she's doing all these things and she's going through stuff and I can understand. I just need to know if I should forgive her or not. The, the answer is you could forgive, but you can't forget about all of these things. He wrote in such detail and so poetically about all of the sexual encounters she's had with this guy. And on at least five occasions that you described in, in great detail. Literally, he wrote like a, an 1800 word essay on this topic. And then I'm supposed to pretend like you're just supposed to say, oh, yeah, no, forgive her, take her back. It's going to be completely fine. The way that you describe it yeah. is like she's over there having an affair with freaking bad Brad Pitt or, or I don't know. Who's the guy? Some guy. That. <laughs> and, and she's all about it. She's having like all of these. I don't know. She's having the time of her life over there. The reality is this, man. It, it, reality is harsh for a guy like you. You're right. He did. He did describe like the that it's exciting to do things when you think people aren't looking. Like he he kind of excused all of her actions in a way. So he's probably, yeah. He's all he's almost already geared to just. Yeah, I don't know. Those don't sound like his him. excuses. This sounds like her excuses that he just bought into. Yeah, excuse for her. Mm -hmm. Excuse for her. Like, oh, yes, this was exciting. Of course you couldn't resist temptation, but of course everybody can. Yeah, and people do. You just don't do it. All the time. And so it's not a real marriage, not in the sense that most people mean. If you want to change the rules and say that, look, you go do your thing, I'll do mine. And we just won't talk about it. Then sure, try that. Fine. You got a post-nuptial agreement. So I'm just going to assume that what that means is you guys have decided how to split the assets and you're good with it and she's good with it. And so let's just assume that that's okay. That means you could do whatever you want with impunity. That also gives her no incentive to stay with you or to be faithful to you because you've already forgiven her. You're going to forgive her again because you're a pushover. And most women don't like pushovers or they like them, but they will push them over when given the opportunity. And if you're one of those, then hey, lots of luck to you, but do not expect. If you're not willing to stand on your own business, if you're not willing to stand up for yourself and demand loyalty from your partner, that she's just gonna give that to you freely. And the fact that you've already let her off the hook and that we're even having this conversation now, if you think for a second that you're going to turn around and just pretend like everything didn't happen and she's going to be this loyal, dutiful wife to you going forward. You are delusional, my friend. And so my advice to you is no, you don't reconcile unless you're going to change the rules. And if the rules is anything other than like, yeah, go explore whatever affair partners you want, but I'm going to do my thing and you're not going to ask me about it. That is a business relationship that you both can get behind and fine. It'll be amicable. Fine. Do that. But if you're going to reintroduce the bounds of marriage with this in the background, good luck with that. I'll see you in my office in about six months. Is what I would say to this guy. So I'm going to conclude, conclude family law after dark on that note that very positive note. I don't know. Closing thoughts on that one. What do you think, Chris? I mean, to each their own. I mean, if it does work for some people. Yeah. I mean, you got to just be honest with your partner. Just be honest about your desires and your needs, because if you're not, then eventually down the line, 11 years later, or however long, you know, it, this is going to come out. 
So yeah, it's it'll honest. come out and, and yeah. be honest with yourself. If you can accept it or not, don't just be like, Oh yeah, 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 I can knowing damn well that you can't. And I, I don't know, man, maybe, maybe it's just his thing. Maybe he likes to know that his wife is out there being with other men and he gets off on it. There's people out there like that in the world. And if that's his thing, then fine. But he's the one over here asking for loyalty. And so I advise him accordingly. If that's what you're looking for, then there's certain prerequisites to that. That she's yeah, not meeting. Like, dude, if you want the, re- if you if you want loyalty, then you got to redefine loyalty in your definition book because you're not going to get it here. So if you're okay with it, fine, stay. If you're not, you know, no. Yes, sir. To- I agree with that. What do you think about that, Dominic? Same thing both of you guys said. <laughs> I'm just like, he's like 25 years old trying to say, yeah, what you said. (laughs) Well, I've been speaking now for about two hours. I think it's time to wrap this show up for all of you that have stuck around for this long through not only our candid discussion on Christopher Watts, but this, this further candid discussion on family law after dark. Thank you so much. There's big thing. There are big things happening for the show. We are continuing to grow. We're continuing to gain subscribers. We've been approached by a couple of different sponsors. That might be coming, that that might turn into a thing. We will see, but there are big things happening over here on this end. And I look forward to to exploring what that's going to look like. And for all of you that have been with me from the beginning and continue to ride on this train, well, there's not a crash in sight. We're going to continue to ascend as long as you continue to tune in. And so with that, and on that note, we will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.